Hey there, leading ladies. Welcome to the Women Physicians Lead Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lisa Herbert, a two-time best-selling author, speaker, family physician, and executive leadership coach with over 20 years experience of providing primary care and serving as a healthcare leader. If you are a woman physician ready to make a change in your career and have a seat at the leadership table, then you are in the right place. I'm excited to provide you with the crucial skills you need to be a successful leader and strategies to deal with workplace challenges. So put on your headphones and listen as we explore the new world of building women physician leaders. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Women Physicians Lead Podcast. I am really excited today to bring you another amazing guest, Micheline Davis. Micheline Davis and I have cross paths in our backgrounds. I'm going to tell you later on, we have very similar backgrounds where we have cross paths um, in terms of where she is in New- where she has come from in New Jersey and also um, her current role as the president and CEO of the National Medical Fellowships. So I'm going to read Micheline Davis's bio. It's amazing. And then I have some interesting information to share with you about her journey and also learn a little bit more about her in terms of her role at the NMF. So Micheline Davis assumed the role of president and chief executive officer of NMF in May of 2021. Founded in 1946, NMF was one of America's first diversity organizations and remains the only national organization advancing health equity at the intersection of health and wealth. It provides scholarships to black, indigenous, people of color, medical and health profession students underrepresented in medicine to ensure equity of access to culturally competent, high quality health care. NMF also increases the number of BIPOC clinical leaders to diversify clinical trials. Davis is named among Modern Healthcare Magazine's top 25 most influential minority leaders in healthcare and Becker's Hospital Review's top 113 great leaders in healthcare 2022, and also top 50 African Americans to know in healthcare. Davis most recently served as Executive Vice President and Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health the largest academic medical center system in New Jersey, and one of the largest in the nation. She founded social impact and community investment and equity-centered policy-led community health practice addressing the social and political determinants of health. She was the first African-American in state history to serve as chief policy counsel to former New Jersey Governor John S. Corzine, the first African-American and only the second woman to serve as New Jersey State Treasurer. She was the youngest person to serve as CEO of the New Jersey Lottery and also served as a senior policy advisor in the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services. She is a author, a co-author, Changing Missions, Changing Lives, How a Change Agent Can Turn the Ship and Create Impact, published by Forbes Books in 2020. And she is also a highly sought after speaker, having presented to numerous audiences as diverse as the American Cancer Society, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, National Council for Mental Well-Being, and National Academies of Sciences, Engineers, and Medicine. So please join me in welcoming Micheline Davis to the Woman Physician Leads podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Herbert. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, absolutely. So I'm excited to start this conversation with you today. You know, um, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, when I was introducing you, we have so much to talk about. This is like a full 360 moment for me, um, (laughs) knowing that, you know, I'm talking with someone who serves an organization that was very instrumental in my own life and very instrumental, you know, in my um, journey as a medical student and also as a physician. So being an NMF alumni is just, you know, I'm, I'm beyond words right now. So we're going to start off this interview by asking you, and if you could share with us a little bit about your journey. So when you think about your journey, your career, and, and the leadership path that you've taken, who or what may have been instrumental in that decision? 
So first of all, I cannot thank you enough for um, having me here today, but also for being on the planet at exactly right now. You are exactly what NMF was founded for. We thank you for shining your bright light all over this space um, and for being the incredible physician leader that you are. So let me start there. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's so funny. So when you, when you asked that question, you know, it was almost as if um, I want to say, you know, you, you were. Um, and let me tell you what I mean by that. It was the, 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 the knowledge that you were somewhere in the hemisphere and needed something like NMF and others to make a way for you to be able to get to where you are right now and the ability to shine right? Yes, it yes. was the knowledge that your brilliance, your insight, your character, the integrity that you bring to everything you touch, that literally that that was, was out there somewhere and needed for those of us who are coming before you to just pave some ways, move some, some walls, right? Knock them down to get people like you to where you are today. So um, I, I guess I get that thought, that, that impetus from um, the folks who raised me, I um, uh, am grateful for your incredibly gracious um, introduction. You know, people always tell all the good glories. Nobody talks about the fall downs, the fallouts, the, the fell unders, right? Um, so I, I have to highlight, um, I was raised by the most impressive people I've ever met in my life. Mm. And I, um, as you know, and as, as the, the Bible bio tells you, it, it literally has been just the, the, the understanding that I've had an opportunity to work with some absolutely incredible folks, uh, statesmen, governors, presidential candidates who became presidents, et cetera. And uh, despite it all, I am still the most impressed with the folks who raised me. Mm. They yes. put it all into action. It was never just talked about. It was always demonstrated proven out and a commitment for the entire family. And so um, uh, I, I think that it was really being raised to believe that we are all here for a purpose and a reason, and that it was always going to be in order to fulfill a promise that was for more than just ourselves, mm, right? Yeah. That um, it made no sense that we would receive blessings and good breaks and everything else, and that it would only be for us, that we're supposed to pull our entire community through any slit in the wall on the barrier of inequity um, uh, that was preventing and presenting opportunity so that we could squeeze as many of us in as possible, right? So I, I think that that had a great deal to do with it. And then um, as you read in that bio, which I realize is too long, girl, uh, but that, right, I was feeling old as you were reading. I was like, well, really? <laughs> It's all good stuff, though. It's all good. Oh, you know, yeah. young and fruitful. Um, it, it, it literally is the 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 um, aspect of understanding that when you were on on purpose, and you really have to be about that business, right? Just like everyone um, who who listens to you, because that's what draws us to you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, I think there's been a lot of that, but it's also been some of the greats who I may have never met personally, but I always say that they. Um, they spiritually guided me, right? So the Mary McLeod Bethunes of the world, the Dorothy Heights of the world, right? Yeah, Those yeah. individuals really laid the groundwork for the kind of person I wanted to be and that that kind of person would be called to leadership um, meant that we had to bring that quest for justice and, and equality into medicine and into clinical care, right? And into healthcare administration. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I love how you talk about this um, sense of community, right? Because I, you know, myself obviously experienced that growing up. It was, I mean, the entire community was rallied behind, you know, me going to medical school and obtaining this medical degree because they knew what that meant, right? That not only meant that it was going to be a positive experience and a positive direction for me, but it also meant that I was uplifting an entire village, an entire community that was going to be serving, right? Hundreds and, and thousands of people who may not otherwise have had have access, you know, to healthcare. So, and I think that that's wonderful to kind of bring that sense of community into the work, you know, that you're doing with NMF. 
So I know that um, NMF, you know, as I've read and as I've talked with you and as I've experienced myself, really envisions this diverse healthcare workforce that exemplifies, you know, the leadership, education, commitment, and cultural competency necessary to achieve health equity for all. So why is diversity or why do you feel diversity in leadership as it pertains to having, right, um, BIPOC leadership, BIPOC positions, why is that vital to healthcare? Yeah, so thank you so much for the question. Um, I, I will tell you this, and I want to even start for why it is that we utilize BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and persons of color, um, when, you know, for, for a long time, historically, um, uh, uh, organizations dedicated to, to uh, issues of, of inequality were, were really utilizing the term minority. And, and uh, I think that what's really happened over the last two years is the fact that the rest of the world has begun realizing what, what you and I and lots of your listeners have already known, right? That people are not minorities, they are minoritized, right? Communities are not vulnerable, they are made vulnerable as a result of structural and um, uh, systemic inequity, right? No one wakes up in the morning and decides, I, I, oh, oh, I want to have a higher incidence of, of breast cancer mortality. Nobody does that, right? We don't pick that for breakfast, right? right. And so it, it really is... Um, uh, the aspect of the fact that at NMF, we've really taken a look at the fact that, listen, we know that structural and systemic racism have created not just the social, but the political determinants of health, right? Mm -hmm. Which uh, derive from the vestiges of historic and even present day racism and inequity and form the multifaceted experience of Black, Indigenous, and persons of color in this country, right? It literally creates the framework through which we must navigate. And we know that wealth inequality, we know that food insecurity, we know that the lack of safe and affordable housing, environmental injustice, racial trauma, all of it, unequal access to quality education, political disenfranchisement, right? I.e. people trying to make it harder to vote, um, right? We know that all these ever-present threats continue to fuel the health disparities among our populations. So it's so keenly important that we ensure that we are creating pathways, meaning that we are, we are pushing back the ties of structural inequity right? Please know that in my mind, I see the party of the Red Sea. I'm so sorry. But we are pushing back the tide of structural <laughs> inequity. I'm a bitch's yes. daughter. That's what happens, right? In order to create a dry ground pathway for the individuals from the same communities that we are talking about that have had to weather the, the, the burden of inequity the most, right? To get them into positions of being clinicians and clinical leaders and healthcare administrators, because what happens when the individuals who have had the, the end user experience of any system is that they innately come to the leadership of that system with, yes, the, the clinical experience, yes, the, the, the educational attainment but the lived experience mm, right? yes. that helps yes, us yes, to yes. actually identify. So where are the flaws in the design process? Yes. How are our healthcare systems, our insurers, right? Our hospitals, our clinics, how are we inadvertently contributing to the proliferation of healthcare disparities? Because how are we inadvertently contributing to the proliferation of structural systemic racism in our communities? Yes. Right? So it's so keenly important that we have, yes, more BIPOC in particular, but more BIPOC from these communities, right? Absolutely. And not just that we're talking about, well, we need to dismantle the, the current structures and systems, which is true, but we need to dismantle them so that when we are, are reestablishing them, that we have already borne out the leaders who are ready to head them and yes. lead them to yeah. where we need to go to have a more equitable future. Absolutely. Yeah, <clears throat> that, you know, wow, that was really powerful because um, I think that's the piece that a lot of organizations forget, right, as they're starting to think about this transformation, knowing that something has to change, something has to be different in order for us to be able to um, uh, call ourselves, you know, a, a healthcare place that is um, equitable for all, right? We have to have leaders who look like the people who we serve because just as you said, because of those lived experiences, because if that person can relate 
to the person who's in front of them, um, it's going to increase the ability for that particular person to be able to listen, to follow, you know, the instructions of the, of the physician, um, <clears throat> and to be able to actually have some trust as well. So that, that becomes really important. Um, so I just wanted to take some time now to, and I'm sure that you're aware of these statistics, but I want to, to relate to our readers, just some of these statistics. And I think that's going to lead us into why, again, it's really important for us to talk about, um, retaining diverse, um, healthcare leaders. So the CDC, um, notes that black women are three times as likely to die from a pregnancy related cause than white women. The Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health found in 2018 that African Americans were 30% more likely to die from heart disease than non-Hispanic whites. The organization also found that African American adults are 40% more likely to have high blood pressure than non-Hispanic whites, yet they are less likely to have their blood pressure under control. So, and these statistics obviously, you know, have been out there. We're very much aware of them. Um, it resonates with me because my grandfather at the age of 50, you know, died of a massive heart attack. And, and the reasons obviously, you know, really relate to lack of access to health care, um, race, and also um, the, the wealth disparity. So when we look at these disparities and especially how the pandemic has lifted the lid on them and exposed, I think, the disparities to a great degree. How would the ability to recruit and retain this diverse healthcare leadership workforce help reduce those disparities and improve care? So I love that you provide your listening audience with this wonderful contextual framework that provides for us what is our, our current day reality. Sometimes when folks begin hearing um, uh, about the need for health equity, they think all the way back to the government's uh, uh, forced experimentation uh, on the on the um, uh, you know black men at at, at uh, Tuskegee Institute. Um, they think about right um, HLA and and uh, what happened with Harriet Lack. They they don't think about the fact that there are contributing factors in current day um, that are still occurring right now. So the numbers that you just um, uh, stipulated, you know, you, you lost your grandfather at 50 to a massive heart attack. I lost my sister at 50. Mm, yeah. Right. Um, and it was because they, they she, she suffered from MS and was telling them that she was having she was in crisis um, and um, they thought that she was drug seeking. Mm. Wow. Right. That's 2015. That's not 1856. Right. 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 It certainly is in 1619. So um, uh, the research is pretty sound. The research actually that has been coming out has illustrated and evidenced the fact that, you know, as we take a look at maternal mortality, uh, Black babies live longer when they have Black doctors. Mm -hmm. Yes. Black mothers have the same. Yes. Right? So it's so interesting to me. I once had a conversation with someone when I was talking about the fact that the reason why the nation and the world needs more BIPOC uh, clinicians is because of our capacity to literally ensure, right, the, the lengthening of the lifespan mm. for those that we treat. Absolutely. And what is so incredibly important about that is that that is not just particular to communities of color. Rather, and I think what COVID has shown us, right, that when, um, uh, you know, if we try to neglect one area of our community, we find out how intricately interwoven we all are. Right. Yes. And so what happened in COVID? We saw how those workers who everybody else, right? Nobody was 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 saluting them as heroes before our essential workers, right? Mm -hmm. um, that are largely black and brown and on the front line. We literally saw that recently, I think it was a time that came out with the article that now the mortality of COVID deaths has actually shifted in reference to the demographic. And we're seeing more white Americans who are actually dying as a result. Mm -hmm. Right. But had everybody gotten vaccinated, perhaps we wouldn't have right? The morphing of the virus as we see it today, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that we're all connected. So the reason why I mentioned that in particular when I talk about why it's important for everyone, not just members of BIPOC communities, that we have my, more BIPOC clinicians, not just uh, is there is the evidence showing that, yes, it is true. BIPOC patients have a greater air, levels of trust as a result, not of just because their clinician is of color, but when their, commission, when their clinician also demonstrates a higher level of cultural awareness, a deeper level of medical humility, 
Mm. Right? A greater sensitivity and awareness of tradition. Yes. And understanding that then the patient and physician experience is more enriched. The patient is more engaged, is more likely to share and ask questions. Right? Yes. And then is even proven to, to literally be more medically compliant. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it has a great deal to do with the approach of the clinician. And then, of course, the 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 um, paradigm of that relationship. But in addition to that, it's so funny because the corollary is, is then, you know, I've had this question asked of me. Well, then is it that black doctors can only treat black patients? Absolutely not. Right. Right. We're still studying in mainstream institutions. And so as a result of that, black excellence just happens to be excellent for everybody. Right. Right. And so as a result of that. We tend to treat everyone uh, just as well. But the issue here is that either we wait for everybody else in the mainstream to, to overcome their implicit bias, which, by the way, has been a part, so much a part of their society, so much a part of, of our experience that, quite frankly, it would take an entirely new lifetime to undo that which they have been right fed in the box. Sure. Right? So I want to acknowledge that. I really do, because I don't want to say in any way that we that that those efforts don't count. They absolutely do. Right. Right. That being said, I probably don't want to want to want to wait around for that next generation in order to unravel some of those pieces in order to get there. When, quite frankly, I could be dealing with chronic disease as I am today. Right. So it's really keenly important that we have a deep understanding of the fact that, yes, more BIPOC clinicians uh, in direct patient care actually encourages better health outcomes because of that patient engagement, because quite frankly, of the knowledge and understanding of structural and systemic racism oftentimes has coded uh, everything from medical education to medical diagnoses. And then let's even jump over to the clinical research space, right? Mm -hmm. We have hailed the COVID-19 vaccine um, as the most diverse clinical trial in America's history. And in fact, it was but upwards of 74 to 82% were still mainstream, right? Yes. Yes. Right? So we, if in fact we want to have medical efficacy for everybody, then we've got to have the diversity from the very beginning of the development of the medicine, as well as the protocols and the treatment modules and everything in between. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It makes a whole lot of sense. Hey there, leading ladies. It's Dr. Lisa. Thanks for hanging in with me. Now back to our amazing interview. It's time for physicians to rise up, step out, stand out, and take back our place in healthcare to be the respected voice and leader in our communities. My mission is to help physicians transition into leadership roles by equipping them with the personal and professional development skills that they need to be successful and also to help them care for themselves physically, mentally, and spiritually. If you have experience practicing in your given specialty, if you have a gift for innovation and building teams, if you have the ability to bring about change in others, if you have solved problems in your practice setting or community, then there are organizations that need you to claim your rightful seat at the table and lead. If you are ready to be a leader in healthcare and change the status quo, then I invite you to book a complimentary strategy discovery session with me at schedulewithdrlisa.com. That's schedule with Dr. D-R Lisa, L-I-S-A dot com. And I think the bottom line really is that you talked earlier about creating these pathways and you, you've sort of imagined the, the parting of the seas, right? So when we talk about this pathway to um, reaching, you know, this, this health care equity for all, the direct pathway to me seems simple. I mean, it's just increasing the number of culturally aware, you know, um, physicians uh, and leaders who have that, uh, who have those qualities, like you mentioned, you know, the, the humility, the understanding of the, of the tradition, um, who are also excellent in what they do and giving them the opportunity to be able to serve those people who are in dire need of those type of physicians and healthcare professionals, just create that direct pathway for them to be able to be great. 
Exactly right. Right. For them to be able to be great. I love great. it. Yes. Yes. So what is NMF's approach to reducing um, these disparities? And um, what would it take for other organizations to support diversity in healthcare, especially during these times? I'm very interested, you know, for to hear about it, but also for you to tell the listeners, you know, how NMF is really approaching this, this challenge. Well, thank you so much for that. I, I will tell you, I've just crossed a year at being at NMF, but NMF has been here since 1946. It was founded over 76 years ago because of the issues that we are still talking about today. Mm -hmm. And it was founded during a time when, um, quite frankly, uh, hospitals were still segregated and specialty uh, uh, medical education was still segregated. And so there had to be a mechanism in order to make certain that more Black physicians could have access to the opportunity to hone those skills and develop those specialties to treat this population. And then in the 1970s, we opened up and realized that we need to make certain that we are also including our indigenous brothers and sisters, our Latino brothers and sisters and Latinx brothers and sisters. And so, you know, we're we're just doubling down right now on our historic mission to provide scholarships and support students who have been underrepresented or rather, right, kept out, prohibited from advancing in medicine. Let's let's tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we've adopted seven strategic framework pillars as I worked with over uh, 250 stakeholders and interested parties and then had these fantastic discussions with the members of our board that the National Medical Fellowships uh, Board of Directors is um, second to none. I serve on several boards across this country and globally. And you wanna talk about dedicated professionals. We have a fantastic board chair, Dr. Sandra uh, B. Nichols, who I call the honorable uh, Madam Chair, who is also an alum of NMF. Um, And so, those strategic pillars are as follows. The first one of which is to build an endowment for a sustainable future. Uh, Listen, Dr. Lisa, I'm gonna tell you, I I don't know of other um, 75, 76 year old institutions who have an endowment that's less than a million dollars like we do, Mm. right? And so it shows the fact that, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, the, the, The enduring need for NMS work to advance health equity continues and is now greater than ever, but that we need to make certain that we've got a strategy that shores it up for the future so that should these issues still be here in the next 76 years, that NMF is still here as well, right? Right. So we want to make certain that we are building a large and permanent endowment to to provide this reliable resource um, uh, into perpetuity. But the, the, the second element of that prong is to build larger and more scholarships for these students. I am delighted that that NMF was able to provide you with a scholarship when you were in school. But the yeah. students who are in school right now are dealing with the inflation that made us all uh, clutch our pearls just a few months ago when we were looking at gas prices, right? right. And so we've right. got to make certain that our scholarships are keeping pace with the inflation and the rise of medical education. So that's that first prom, mm-hmm. right? So we've committed to building an endowment of $25 million within the next three to five years. Now that sounds audacious, but it's only audacious for those who have not come from a background of people who have had to cross the Atlantic and come to a land where they knew, right, no one and had no name and have forged ahead and become clinicians and heads of healthcare systems and presidents of medical schools and presidents of the, of the country, right? So for anybody else, I would tell you it's probably impossible, but not for us. That's not what our legacy tells us, mm-hmm. right? Our second pillar is to advance thought leadership, which is exactly what you are helping us to do right now. Mm. I would ask that others of your of your listening audience who, who um, believe in health equity and understand the impact of racial trauma as we do, that you would share your opportunities of platform with us, that we would do some joint things together. And so just as you were having me on this podcast right now, in order to talk about this issue, we are able to literally make certain that NMF is a hidden figure no more. Absolutely. Right? Yes. So we, we, we are so grateful to you for it. Our, our third pillar is to really engage in impactful policy partnerships, right? This is a new element for, for NMF. But in order to advance systemic change, the kind that's really needed to eliminate and not just reduce the systemic and structural racism that has contributed to the proliferation of healthcare disparities, we know that we've got to do exactly what Bishop Tutu told us to, that it's not enough to just keep pulling people out of the river. We got to go upstream and find out why they are falling in Mm. and then build the dam, right? So that is what we are trying to do by having policy partnerships. So we are seeking to partner 
with other organizations who have the same type of um, uh, audacious goal to create a more equitable world, right? So that we can build transformative relationships with those who are making um, those policy decisions to advance public policies that tackle health disparities, right? So we really wanna forge alliances with those who educate our children, young adults, our healthcare professionals and scientists around exactly how we can do this in a way that, that has us working together to advance and develop a workforce that looks more like those that we serve. Right. Yes. So that's a key component to this. Our fourth pillar is that that topic we talked about a moment ago, the diversification of clinical research. Right. It is well understood that clinical research in medicine lacks diverse investigators and far too often fails to inclusively select participants. And so as a result of that, we are really trying to wrap our arms around this space in particular to make certain that everyone has access to culturally competent health care. And that that begins, quite frankly, at even how we are increasing medical effect, um, uh, efficacy, right? Mm -hmm. So we're really hoping to diverse uh, the investigators who lead clinical research. We're opening the door for individuals who might otherwise never consider participating in a research study because they're never invited into that space. The research tells us that the reason why more individuals are um, uh, from diverse backgrounds are not in clinical research studies is because they're never invited. Right, Implicit yeah. bias shows up in that in that exchange between them and their primary care physician or them and their specialist. And the specialist rules them out automatically mm -hmm. for everything that they think to be true, which is really, right, a stereotype yeah. trope, right? So, so we're looking to overcome that. Then we're looking to launch a robust mentorship network because even in that space, the research shows us that the reason why diverse clinical researchers and investigators sometimes leads the profession is because of the lack of mentorship and sponsorship, right? So we're trying to really create a goal to offer a wide array of mentorship opportunities by program specialty and geographic region so that we can ensure that those that we are providing scholarships to today have the proper mentorship through their entire medical career to make certain that they, uh, that they ascend to the highest positions in the field and that they are the leaders that we know that they are called to be, right? Yes. Um, pillar number six is one that I guess I feel like I can't talk about enough. It is to expand a focus on behavioral health and well-being. Mm. Yes. I think probably every single one of your, your listeners have, has heard from their, from their patients and their colleagues the fact that, listen, the, the state of mental health in this country right now, right, is at a tipping point. Yes. We know that that racial trauma harms the well-being of BIPOC communities and that NMF is committed to broadening our mission to care for the mind as well as for the body. Yes. So we want to make certain that we are, are helping to bring up that 4.4 percent of uh, uh, BIPOC clinician in the behavioral health space. But then because we're seeing that that finally, as a result of the, the pressure of living in a pandemic that most folks thought was going to be a 30 day lockdown. And here we are going on three years. Right. That those who have been serving on the front line, that those who uh, uh, have continued to do so. And then in the in the midst of the most politically and racially divisive time that many of us have seen in our lifetimes. Right. Mm -hmm. That we are providing to them the racial trauma informed support. And so we have actually just launched with our alumni alliance. I love this. Uh, through our active uh, alumni nation nationwide listen and learn series, a partnership with the Association of Black Psychologists, mm. where we are literally holding Sawabona healing circles nice. across the country for our alumni. We want to be th there for them, not just when they're in medical school, but now that you are out and you are practicing and you are changing the world, you are holding up our communities and we want to hold you up in turn, right? Wow, that's so... Nice. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I will tell you, we just had our first run brought me to tears the, the the level of authentic vulnerability that that individuals are willing to come to in order to literally have this opportunity one with another to have a supportive community is, um, oh, my goodness, it, 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 I want to tell you, it's, it's like an ode to the ancestors. It really is why we are meant to be in community one for another. And then my final one, the one that if we can get this right, then I can go on home to glory, Dr. Lisa. <laughs> um, 
And that is pillar number seven, to develop a strong and comprehensive student pipeline. Mm. Oh, right? yes. Yes, to really create that pathway. I will tell you, NMF has historically focused on ensuring that we are there for students once they get to medical school. But we realize that if I were to wave a magic wand right now, even with the heightened number of applicants as released in the AAMC study, where we saw that Black applicants are up 21% for Mm -hmm. medical school, if we were to wave a magic wand and pay for everybody's right? Medical education right now, it would only be one eighth of one quarter of a drop in a bucket. Wow. Yeah. So what we realize is that mm -mm, we can't wait for them to come to medical school. We got to go get them. Yes. (laughs) We got to go get, we got to go get my babies. We got to go out and make certain that there are, that we are (laughs) separating that red sea and permitting them to cross over dry ground um, uh, much earlier in line. And so we're in discussions right now with several entities that are really focused on STEM education for BIPOC communities much earlier. I'm talking about in high school, middle and uh, middle, middle, middle and, and elementary yes. school. Yes, yes absolutely. Right? And then if we can get them, uh, 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 I used to say cradle to the grave, but I'm going now I'm going to be as audacious to say from conception to the educational grave to literally make certain that we have them in a continuum of uh, uh, STEM education through partnerships with others. We can seed the scholarships today for the ones who are in the fifth grade right now Mm. so that those scholarships have matured and are ready for them to walk right from undergrad into medical school, right? Absolutely, yeah. And you know, they have to know, they have to know that it's possible. And I think that's that's brought to the early age, like you said. You know, just the possibility of becoming a physician. Um, I think that, you know, obviously we want to go out and get those high schoolers as well. But sometimes that could be late in the process. Yes, yes. Very late. So what what does the um, uh, the, the, the educational data tell us? It tells us that, right, now the fifth grade, if we don't kind of get on that radar by the fifth grade, then, you know, lots of the girls have already decided, well, you know, science is not for me. Right. A lot, lot of BIPOC students have decided math is not for us. I'm just like, time out. We built pyramids. Time out. Wait a minute. Right. We created math. Right. right. We created math. So I'm just like, no, we, we've got to be able to bring all this back to them to say that this, there is nothing new about this. This is in your DNA. Yes. This is exactly who you are, who you're called to be. This is for you. Mm-hmm. You created medicine. Yeah, right. absolutely. Absolutely. Right? These are some <clears throat> wonderful um, pillars, you know, for NMF to really go after and to um, ensure that we're going to have, like you said, the next generation of BIPOC leaders. So the seven pillars, again, I just want to repeat for those who, uh, you know, are listening. And the first is so important, and that is the endowment and the scholarships, right? Because we need the funding. Yes. I mean, there's That's right. right. I mean, there's no way to kind of support students without that. Um, there's the thought leadership, which is important, um, and the joint partnerships, um, policy partnerships you talked about. Yes. Yes. Diversification of clinical research, mentorship, you know, which is of the utmost importance, focusing on health and well-being. Um, I can't tell you how important that is. And I'm so, so happy that you are doing that work and that NM- NMF is supporting that work um, and healing the minds, you know, yes. of our professionals. And then the last is developing um, the student pipeline. So if, you know, the listeners or, or anyone who's going to be listening to this interview, if they wanted to support NMF in any one of these pillars or multiple, hopefully, uh, you know, of these yeah. pillars, um, how would they get in contact with you or the organization? What would be that next step? Well, I, I love you for asking the question and, and I would encourage them um, to, to indeed think, think broadly about that, but to reach out to us directly, um, we are online at www.nmfonline.org. They can even shoot me a direct uh, email at mdavis at nmfonline.org. Um, but they can go online and take a look at that strategic framework. It's there in detail, just waiting for them. Listen, they can join us in Miami on November the 5th at our national gala. Come down and, and cultivate relationships. Be a part of us. Um, I invite them, especially for those in biopharma, um, to, to think through what a partnership could look like and how we would build up our 
diversity in clinical research portfolio, uh, uh, you know, uh, all the more. Uh, I invite individuals to think about including us as one of your uh, nonprofit organizations will be hitting, right, the fourth quarter of the year. And I know that lots of folks like to make their donor advisory fund donations, et cetera. Please consider us. Consider the fact that by so doing, we are literally lengthening the lifespan of those in our communities. At the conclusion of uh, 2020, uh, uh, the Henry J. Kaiser Foundation did a, um, a survey and found out that we lost over 3,200 healthcare workers. Wow. Yes the majority of whom are all black and brown. Mm. We literally created 300,000 as a result of COVID. COVID created 300,000 orphans in America. Yeah. All of which are black and brown. Mm. All of which, right? So we are trying to capture, because most of the time they have been the students of those workers, right? Yes. The, the, the children of those workers. We're trying to attach to them in order to bring them through this process. Because not only have we not kept rate with the proportionality of our presence in the general population. But now as a result of COVID, we are an entire generation behind. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Help us to build this pathway of future generations for the health and well-being of our communities. Absolutely. Donate today. Thank you so much. This has been an awesome interview. And like I said in the beginning, uh, definitely a full circle moment for me. Um, we are definitely going to keep in touch. I love the work that you're doing at NMF. And um, it has really just brought me back into the fold. I mean, I, I'm ready to, you know, to jump in with both feet. <laughs> We need you. We need every <laughs> NMF alum out there. And I would tell you, some don't even know that they're alums. So I know. Contact I know. us. Yes, yes. And we will look you up in the database. I guarantee you that you're a family. Come back home, family. Yes. Come back home. Yes, absolutely. Thank you again so much um, for this interview. This is um, going to inspire so many of our listeners. And I'm sure that it's going to um, increase the support for NMF and just continue to do all the great work that you're doing. Thank you so much, Dr. Lisa. You do the same. You are the bright and shiny light that NMF was created for. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening today and for allowing me to be a part of your career journey. To continue receiving leadership support, I invite you to join our private Facebook group, Building Women Physician Leaders at www.leadingladiesincharge.com. Until next time, take care.